It's, it's a nice bowl. I give no shits. Hello you dirty potters, how are you today? Today we're going to be doing the Q&A video for the 10K celebration because we made it to 10K subscribers. Whoop, whoop. I can now officially with confidence call myself a YouTuber and along with that status comes a slew of questions on a daily basis, especially that of in my comments section. I feel kind of bad because I don't have the actual time per day to sit down and answer all of these questions on my Instagram, on my Twitter, on my Tumblr, on my Facebook fan page, and on YouTube, although I really would like to. So every now and then I do a Q&A just to kind of clear the air and just get most of those questions out of the way, whether they be ceramic or about my personal life. So today, that's what we're doing. But I also figure since it is a 10K video, I might as well do a giveaway. In this video, I will be giving away this cup. It's a blue I just developed and it has silver luster on it. Now this is a little bit rare because I don't like doing giveaways and it's not like I don't like doing giveaways because I don't like giving away my stuff. I have no problem with separating myself from my artwork as long as it goes to a good home that'll love it and use it every day. The reason I don't do many giveaways is because I feel like they're kind of cheap. I see far too many YouTube videos of other people just doing giveaways on like a weekly or monthly basis just to get their subscriber numbers and their like numbers up, and I, I don't like it. I feel like it's clickbait. So I opt out for doing it on very rare occasions. And this is one of those rare occasions. So before we even start the video, because let's be 100 with each other, let's be honest with each other, we've never lied to each other, why would we start now? Some of you are here just to win this mug, and if you wanna win this mug, you of course have to do all the stereotypical things that a YouTuber would ask you to do. You have to have already been subscribed, you have to like the video, and you have to leave some sort of wordage or comment down below. I haven't figured out what you guys should leave for a comment though. I know, leave the word send nudes in the comment below along with anything else you want and you will be automatically entered as long as you have already done all the other things as well. And I'm not telling you guys I don't do giveaways very often because I want you to feel some scarcity as far as the market of my artwork goes. Trust and believe, my subscribers or the people who have been following me for quite some time know that's actually true. I almost never do giveaways. Not only do I almost never do giveaways, I have absolutely no problem destroying my own artwork. And half the time, when I say I'm gonna send you something that I actually like, I mean it. Because the stuff that I don't like, that a lot of other people do like, I, I have no problem killing it. Here, look, I have a bowl next to me. You see it? It's really nice. It has floating blue inside. It's a nice little bowl. I actually like it quite a bit. It's, it's a nice bowl. I give no shits. I don't see everything that comes out of my kiln as some special little snowflake that I grab onto for dear life because I think everything has a purpose in the world. I find value in the things that I find value in and anything else, I destroy. So when I say I'm doing a giveaway, you better jump on that train. And with that groundwork being laid down so you guys understand exactly where I'm coming from, let's get into the questions. Also, if I don't read your question, I'm really sorry, but most likely your question was just you asking me on how to do stuff, like how to make bubble glaze, or how to wedge your clay correctly, and I can't actually go through that and do a demo on a Q&A. So if I skip your question or I don't get to it, I either didn't have enough time, or you asked me to do something so complicated that it would require an actual full video for it. The first question by Jennifer Huss. How many questions are you going to answer? I'm actually not really sure, Jennifer. I asked for questions and I received way more questions than I thought I would actually get. So I collected a bunch and I'm kind of just picking and choosing. But if you want to know the real answer, just, you know, keep watching. Rhonda Farah, I'm not, no, that's not happening. I'm not saying the rest of that name. Your name's Rhonda. I know you've recommended books on glazing before, but do you have any favorite books on pottery? Yes, I actually have favorite glazed books and favorite pottery books. Uh, I have a bookshelf with all my glazed books. Let me go get it. Okay, I got them. I have three ceramic books that I recommend to almost anybody who's starting out in ceramic artwork or just wants to learn how to make glazes in general. And one of them, The Ceramic Formula and Complete Compendium, right? I love this book. I like this book because it goes into the intricacies of, of the glaze minerals and it actually teaches you what your glazes are made of on a chemical and element level. That's why I love this book. It's old and tattered and gross because I've read it a billion times. It's like, I tore it at one point on accident. It's written by John W. Conrad. Uh, I, I like this book. It's a little bit complicated for beginners, but at some point when you start making your own glazes, you are going to need to learn how to manipulate and use your glazes on a chemical level. Like, 
you're gonna have to learn what's in your glazes on an elemental level, right? You're gonna have to get used to reading the periodic table like a potter. The second book, which is this one, is the Cone 5-6 Glaze Book. This one has some pottery techniques in it, as well as some kind of like tried and true glazes that I stick to every now and then. I think it's only edited, it's not like it's an actual version of a book. Yeah, see, it's, it's edited by Bill Jones, says down there, and that's because these are a bunch of ceramic recipes that people have collected over time. This is essentially just a collection of recipes that people have found very useful that's edited by another person who happens to have all these recipes. But this book goes a little bit through the chemistry and the glazing process and how to weigh your chemicals. It goes through it on a very basic level, kind of like the video that I had made for you guys about how to put your glazes together for your first time. So this book, this book does that in written form and it has a lot of good recipes in the back. And for the potter that's literally just learning how to make their glazes, get this one from Manuel Cooper. The whole book is literally just glaze recipes and test styles. There's almost nothing else in here. You just want glaze recipes and to test them out in your own atmosphere. Just get this book. The entire book is just that. I'm actually very lucky that this is a hardcover because this, like, I've messed with these books way too much. This one's from Gregory Vogelman. It says, can you make a sealable container, i.e. a coffee canister? Yes, it's actually very easy. Uh, you can just buy those little plastic ones that go on coffee containers and then make that to fit. You buy those first and then you measure it out and make those to fit and because they're plastic and stretchable, you just stretch them very tightly over your cylinder. So you have a little bit of wiggle room, but it's very easy to make them, actually. I, I just don't do them because I feel like everyone knows how to do it. Caitlin Marion says, how do you keep your pieces moist for longer? Between school and work, my pieces dry out before I get to trim them, even when I try covering them with bags. Okay, I get this question a lot, and here's the main problem. The majority of people that cover their stuff with bags and then say that their pottery still dries out are getting very low quality bags. Half of the time you guys take the clay out of the bag and then try and use that same stiff clay bag to cover your pieces as if it's a one for one fit, but you essentially need a garbage bag. You need something like this. You need a big plastic bag, something that's moldable that'll move around your piece and keep a little biodome of moisture inside. I'm pretty sure I already did a video on this, but if you're not putting your piece on a platform, right? Something like this and then putting plastic over it and tucking it underneath the piece so that there's no air holes or nothing gets in there then you're doing it wrong. That's probably why your pieces are drying out. Sometimes I get people who are like, I'm doing that, and then I ask them to send me a video of them doing it, and that is not what they're doing. They're using very poor quality plastic, they're using porous stuff. The goal of making sure your pottery doesn't dry out or letting it slow dry is to make sure that no moisture escapes. That means if you have any little air holes or anything underneath that plastic, air is gonna get in there and it's gonna dehydrate your pottery. That's what you need to be doing, is wrapping it up very well in very good plastic. I would suggest a garbage bag. Andriana Morris asks, are there any ceramic conventions that you go to? I'm planning on going to Ensika. I've already talked to uh, Tim C about it. I'm probably gonna talk to my friend Steven about it as well. I'm pretty sure Tim C has like his own crew he goes with. You know what I mean? He doesn't want to hang out with my young butt. That was weird, I don't know why I said young butt. But I am planning on going to Ensika. I am planning on meeting some of you guys there. I don't expect a lot of you to be there. I'm probably just gonna wear my orange hoodie and walk around and just kind of absorb as much as I can. And I use a lot of the information that I take from Ensika as my source. Alexandra Thatcher asked, hey, is there any chance you can make a video reviewing the super cheap under $200 Chinese wheel that are on Amazon or eBay. I would like to know if they're worth buying it as a first wheel, and I bet others would be interested too if that works out. Somebody actually already did a video on this. I will link her video down below, but if you want a real quick answer, no, don't buy it. You know what, don't even take my word for it. Go ahead and go down and look at the reviews, and then go ahead and watch that video, and just, just realize what you're getting yourself into. Maybe if you're a child, maybe if you're like five or seven or eight, yeah, but you're gonna want a real wheel. Buying that type of wheel and then trying to call yourself a potter or saying that you make pots on a ceramic wheel head is kind of like saying you're a biker, but really you only ride a bicycle instead of a motorcycle. Like there's no way you're walking into a bar and being like, yeah, I'm a biker. Puh, look at my tattoo, it says mom right there. It's Cause she's the only lady in my life. And then you all go outside to get on your bikes and they're like, dude, you, you ride a bicycle. And you're like, nah, nah, I'm a biker. This is a bike. 
I'm a biker. No, that's not a real wheel. And no, that's not a real bike. That's a, that's a bicycle. Chaz on Instagram asked, what is your perfect pizza in your opinion? And what is your favorite workout routine? My favorite workout day is back and biceps day, to be honest with you. Second close is chest day, even though there's always people on the chest bench which bugs the crap out of me because they're just texting half the time. And my favorite pizza to get, I know people are gonna think this is gross, I understand that before we move on with this statement. I like pizza with no cheese. I'm lactose intolerant because my dad gave me lactose intolerant genetics and I don't like cheese. It's high calorie, half the time in America, it's high sugar as well, it's high fat, I don't need it, it doesn't taste that good, I would much rather just eat a mushroom pizza with no cheese on it. Oh, super gross! I know, I know I'm a horrible person, I know cheese is wonderful for you, but I'm lactose intolerant because my dad handed me down shitty genetics, so I, I, I don't know what to tell you. This one is from Marcella Lee. Are you considering a weekend or week-long grown-up type person class or series? Something those of us far away could attend. I am actually planning a meetup sooner or later, but I think I need more subscribers. I don't want to plan a meetup and then like four people show up. I am actually this December, on December 2nd, which is like a week away from me recording this, because right now it's Thanksgiving, I'm gonna be throwing a clay party so that all the people who are into my channel in Sacramento can come and be part of that. But she's most likely referring to the fact that I like to cuss at the beginning of the channel. I loved to cuss. I kind of stopped cussing because it got in the way of the actual goal of the channel, which is to teach people, and the majority of people that need to be taught are either children or beginners, or, I mean, both. They're not they're not mutually exclusive. But trust and believe, if we had a meetup, you guys would get 100 Dante. You guys would not get watered down, the semi-perverted jokes Dante. You guys would get booty cheek slapping Dirty Potter Dante. This one's from Carissa on Instagram. I don't remember if it ever came up before, but have you ever considered teaching workshops or classes at local studios or maybe something educational at a panel or convention? No, because number one, I don't have a degree in ceramics. Although I will say, and I know it's gonna sound like I'm tooting my own horn, but I will say I have met teachers that don't know as much as I would just based off my experience alone. I am not kidding you. I have literally met a teacher who's been a teacher for 20 years in ceramic art and has never learned how to smooth their stuff out with a metal rib. That is base. That is like week one of ceramic artwork. And it's not like that's the only one. I've met a bunch of them. I think that happens is some people become teachers and in order to become an art teacher, you don't need an art degree, you just need a regular degree. So you get some math teachers that are teaching art and they just never dedicated part of their lives to ceramic artwork. And then you have someone over here like me who doesn't have a degree, but part of my entire life is about ceramic artwork. So I just end up knowing far more just based off my regular life than they would their professional life or their profession. Which totally makes sense, I don't blame them for it at all. But I will say, I don't think I'm qualified, and if I was, I would have to have somebody ask me. This one's from Hunlock Pottery. What's your favorite form to create? It's an egg form. I love egg forms, I love Korean moon vases, I'm really attracted to the Korean shapes as far as pottery goes. Especially South Korea. South Korea was like, psh, way further ahead in the world of ceramic artwork than most other places for the time. And because of it, they have these beautiful, symmetrical, round, and egg-like shapes, and they, I'm really attracted to them. Some of you guys found my Tumblr page, and some of you got to ask questions anonymously. And all the anonymous questions are, uh, real interesting. One of you Anons asked if I have a crush on any female potters. Yes, I do actually, and she's way too far to interact with, and also the queen, that being my lovely, lovely, wifely girlfriend that I'll never leave. Please don't look at this and be mad at me. Probably wouldn't like it if I went near her. And this might just be a me thing, but for some strange reason, art is super attractive to me. Not even clay, like art in general. Like if you're a seven and you can paint really well, you're automatically bumped up to a nine. I'm just generally attracted to strong people and artists. I don't know why. Sam Sen on Instagram asked, pretty much hooked on your videos right now and I definitely appreciate a YouTube video about this if you have the time. I'd love to hear about your respects, superstitions, rituals, and taboos. I have a couple myself. For example, I have two kiln gods. Kiln gods in Potter culture aren't actual gods. They're essentially pieces of pottery that you respect or survived or there's usually something about them. There's usually some type of energy or some type of thing or special thing about them that keeps them alive. They're essentially seen as the protectors of your kiln. Whenever you get really good pieces out of a kiln and you get to the bottom of the kiln only to find really bad pieces, you'll find many old school potters saying, oh, that was the sacrifice of the kiln gods. That's what they took to give me this better pottery. Most of us are highly aware that's not true, but I personally have two kiln gods. I have a horsehair raku piece up there that's one of my kiln gods, and then I also have an Astro Boy figurine right here, which is 
Highly untraditional, but also one of my kiln gods. I'm pretty sure it's just a correlation fallacy, but whenever I look at this thing and talk to it like a normal human being, I'll walk out of my studio and be like, have a good day, Astro. My kiln load comes out way better, and um, I would have Mega Man, because I'm a giant fan of Mega Man more so than Toby here, actually. I'm so sorry, please don't take that personally. But pound for pound, Astro Boy would whoop Mega Man's butt. Get, argue with me in the comments below. I guarantee if you look up the stats, he would ruin Mega Man's life. One of the things that I also promote very heavily, especially in the summertime, is wrapping all your pottery up to let them slow dry. All too often do I see beginners just putting stuff on a shelf, letting it air dry in the summer, and then they wonder why all their pottery cracks at the bottom. Just get a big garbage bag, cut it right down the middle, lay it out like a big old blanket, and gently put it on the top of your stuff. This will allow kind of like a biodome of moisture to slowly seep out over time. And if you want to, you can even lift it, kind of like sticking your legs out of the cover that night just to keep cool, but also the monster's gonna get you so you can't keep it out for too long. Because you do have to remember, you threw with water, and all that water is stuck inside the pores of the clay. And they need to come out before you put it in the bisque and go through quartz inversion. One of my major pet peeves and taboos that you should never do in a studio, especially if you're sharing, is making bowls on bats, or anything small on a bat that can be used for something else. I'm gonna get a bat and show you. I'm gonna show you right now. You see this? This is a bat, and this goes on your wheel head with little bat pins. I've already done an episode on it if you wanna see it. I will not link it down below. You should have watched it already. Usually in a classroom setting, these bats are used to throw giant pieces that would be very difficult to take off the wheel or to throw plates, which also kind of fit into that category because even though they're not big, they're still difficult to take off the wheel. It is massively not only disrespectful to the people who are actually higher level than you that need these things, but also a massive taboo to use one of these to throw something like this. You do not need this big old bat to throw a little tiny cup on your wheel head. Just because it's easier to take off the wheel head and there's a less of a chance of messing it up, you should have learned by this stage to take your stuff off of the wheel head without messing up your piece in the first place. I've actually done videos on it teaching you guys how to do that and it's not that hard. These bats are highly necessary for the big kids to make stuff like this. We need bats to comfortably take off giant pieces from the wheel that would otherwise mess up because they are literally too big to take off the wheel without a bat. And if you use them all for your little tiny bowls, everyone will be mad at you. This thing's so big it doesn't even fit into the camera. Not only does it show a massive amount of disrespect for your upperclassmen who actually need these things, it also shows a massive amount of inexperience. Because you're basically telling the entire classroom that you can't take stuff off of the wheel without help from a bat. This one comes from Ryan Wells on Facebook. Does music have an influence on your creative drive while you craft? If so, which musician do you believe helps your flow the most when you create? There's a couple artists that I follow. Um, I'm a giant fan of Shiloh Dynasty, although I have a very high suspicion that she is dead from suicide. Unfortunately, the artist that knew her is also dead, so nobody knows where she went. I will put a link down below for you to listen to her music if you want. She was an Instagram and Twitter singer for quite some time. She did very small snippets, the most was like a minute, I think. So the majority of music you find of her nowadays is people remixing her voice. Those of you that know me well most likely know that I have a giant boner for Childish Gambino. I have been following him since the Sick Boy days. If you don't know what that is, you haven't been following him long enough. If you were on the Sick Boy train before he released This Is America or the song 3005, you'll most likely know that he created some really good work in his camp album, and I suggest you guys check it out. He's one of my favorite artists because he goes very hard, but he also totally admits his faults, and I like that type of self-awareness. Self-awareness is something that I value a lot in society because if you have the ability to look in the mirror and really look at your problems, face them face to face, then you can essentially fix them. If you know you're doing something wrong and you can explain it to yourself, no one has to tell you. You can see it from your own point of view. You can see the forest from the trees and that's a very rare thing in our society, I think. A lot of people just go throughout their everyday life never questioning what they do. They just do it because it's what they've been taught to do. But human beings are really interesting. We have the ability to program ourselves and most people I find don't take advantage of that. Most people don't find the time or even want to change their behavior for the better of themselves or society around them just because it's easier to not do that. But at the end of one of Childish Gambino's songs, he goes into this beautiful story about how he liked a girl and he shouldn't have told her in secret. He should have just told everybody his secret. That way nobody could ever hold that secret against him. I'm gonna leave two songs by Childish Gambino down below for you. One of them is what I think kind of encapsulates all of Childish Gambino's career before he got to Redbone. 
And the second one is one of my favorite songs. It's called Bonfire and it is very heavy. It goes very hard. So if you're not ready to just get hyped up, do not listen to it right now. Ryan, I find that I either have two modes. I have the completely silent, conforming, not talking, very brutish Dante, and then I also have the very hyped up, very excited Dante. And those are kind of my two. I don't really stick in between a lot. To be honest, I'm a guy of two extremes, but those would be my kind of two extremes. Childish Gambino being on the hype side, and Shiloh Dynasty being on the very calm side. Mm. Some honorable mentions, Kingdom Hearts music and Steven Universe music immediately calms me down. The song Here Comes a Thought from Steven Universe is my number one, I, I could be raging, I could be Godzilla-ing up the town and I would be fine if you put that on. I would go straight to sleep, I would immediately calm down. I love Steven Universe. There's a couple animes or cartoons that I stick to and that is definitely one of them. Small Ladybug on Instagram asked, most dangerous thing about pottery? I'm gonna give you three things. I'm gonna give you the thing that everyone gets hurt by in pottery. I'm gonna give you the thing that everyone kind of agrees is the most dangerous thing about pottery. And then I'm gonna give you the thing that is personally hurtful to me because I don't have self-control. The thing that everyone kind of agrees about pottery that is the most hurtful is doing pottery. Liking pottery in the first place is going to be a massive addiction that you're probably going to keep going for the rest of your life and every single day that you don't do it, you're gonna think, man, I could really be at my wheel right now instead of dealing with my boss. Not only are you gonna think about it day and night while you're not doing it, you're most likely also gonna spend a lot of money on art supplies, which is wonderful because, you know, give art to the kids. They can't spend it on the drugs. The thing that I've seen most people get hurt by in ceramic artwork is the use of their metal rib and getting their hands cut up by it. They're little tiny cuts, but you do notice them, and that's the thing that kind of hurts most people. That and not waiting for your kiln to cool down before you actually take your pottery out and then being like, oh, I burned my hands. Oh no, what happened? You know what happened. You don't have any patience. That's what happened. And the thing that I find personally infuriating is that I don't have any self-control. I have absolutely no self-control. Once I find something I like or that I want, I go after it and I will just attach to it and I will spend hours and hours and hours and days. You ask my girlfriend, once I find something I like, I cling to it real hard. If she ever leaves me, I'm going to destroy this entire town. And because of this lack of self-control, I find myself wanting to open my kiln when it's like fully torqued to cone six. I'm highly aware that it's like 2,000 something something degrees in there. I'm highly aware. I understand the eye of Sauron is coming out of there and it's red hot glowing elements are probably going to burn my face off like the Ark of the Covenant. But something in my brain tells me to open it up and look in the kiln. And I know I shouldn't do it. I know it'll immediately probably melt my entire body off. And that's probably the thing that is the most hurtful to me is doing stuff that I know I shouldn't do, that I really want to do, that will definitely kill me. Actually, that's not a pottery thing, that's just my life. This one comes from Feel Good Nutrition on Instagram. What made you feel like starting the channel? I think I went over this on my last Q&A, but if I were to shorten the story, um, I made a YouTube channel, right, and I was just messing around for like two to three years on it. I didn't have a regular schedule. I released a video like once every six months. It was not a big deal at all. It was just me goofing around on camera. That's why when you look at when I started my channel versus when my channel actually started growing, my channel actually started growing somewhere around 2017. But as far as me making the channel, it says like 2015 or 16 or something like that. But when our current president got in office, I started to kind of feel this air of depression that the world kind of felt, to be honest with you. Soon after he came into office, the National Foundation for Arts, which is a taxpayer's program, got cut by its funding by a small percentage. And I say a small percentage because I'm gonna say something like 1% and that's gonna sound very small to you guys. But remember, it's a taxpayer's program. So that 1% is quite a bit. And not to mention that art was not getting a lot of funding anyway. This is a foundation that helps provide those field trips, those school supplies, as well as those school classes and anything extra the teacher might need in order to actually teach art. During that time, my class coincidentally got cut in half because the way my school used to work is that you would have to take the class two times before advancing to the next stage. Because my teacher, Yoshio Taylor, understood that it takes a lot of time to develop your ceramic art style and actually get proficient at the wheel. So instead of taking one class and moving on to the next stage and calling yourself intermediate, you were forced to take two classes in order to advance. So I took two beginner classes, moved on. Two intermediate classes, moved on. Two advanced classes, and then I moved on to independent studies in the back of the studio. But right after finishing my first advanced class, they canceled the second one and I had to go straight to independent study. When I looked into it, I learned that our current president pretty much just pulled funding from the National Foundation for Arts, which did not allow for me to have the access or the financing for an extra class. 
it was no longer available in the school and the school cut that class off in order to save funding. Not only did my second advanced class get cut, the other classes got cut too. So everybody took one class. You essentially took eight hours of ceramics once a week for nine months and then called yourself advanced as far as the school curriculum was concerned. But the majority of potters, especially if you're watching this right now, you know that that does not make you advanced. You're probably very aware that it doesn't make you advanced. I'm not saying taking double those classes would make you advanced, but I think we can all agree that taking double those classes would definitely help you in that direction. And combined with the way I think naturally, along with the way my mom raised me, I had one of two options. I could either be that guy who complained about the poor state of what he likes to do on his spare time, or at least his craft, or I could shut up and actually do something about it. Luckily for me, technology had a way. And as long as I could teach myself to edit, get some clay, a wheel, and actually teach people what I already know from my own classes or my own experiences, I automatically had a way to fight back. I started this channel because I was tired of seeing other people creating organizations and binding together and then not making a change in the world. I was tired of people protesting and not actually getting into office, talking to people, doing anything. I don't like inaction and I hate indecisiveness. I hate passive aggression, I hate indecisiveness, and I hate inaction. If you want something, do something about it. But don't sit on the couch all day long and then complain that you're not getting anywhere in your life. So in that same light, I decided to do something about it. So I made the channel. I'm not trying to make money off the channel. I'm not trying to get my name out there. I asked for glazed recipes. A bunch of old potters told me to F off and I just had to go learn myself and get those chemistry books. I made this channel to make sure that my art doesn't die, to make sure that everybody has the availability to do what they wanna do as long as they have that knowledge. And that's all I really wanted. I wanted to fight back against a system that doesn't support artwork. And I figured if my society's not gonna do it, especially through money and my president, then I'm gonna do it myself. That's the reason why I started this channel. I'm simply just trying to send the ladder back down. I am ready. You're not. I'm super ready. You're not. I'm ultra ready. I have to go now. We'll continue this later. 12 o'clock midnight. I had to go do a thing for a long time. Don't worry about it. Rims Clay Things on Instagram asked, when was the most you struggled in your life and how did you overcome that situation? I have a really bad habit of proving people wrong, you know what I mean? The hardest thing that I most likely ever experienced to be 100,000 island dressing with you is um, I was dating a girl that I thought I was straight gonna marry and she ended up leaving me for who I considered to be my brother. He was my best friend for like over 10 to 15 years. He was like blood to me. And the last thing that her and I had a dispute about was ceramic artwork. Unfortunately, I had signed up for a class just to prove her wrong, but during that class, she essentially cheated on me and left me with my best friend. That was probably the most difficult thing in my life, but if anime has taught me anything, your job when something happens to you that, that hits you that hard is supposed to take that pain and turn it into something that's your ally, turn it into your strength. And I honestly tried my hardest for about a year to get really good in that class. I was an awful, awful student. I was horrible. And Yoshio literally just walked by me each and every day, massively disappointed in my artwork. Until one day, him and the teacher's assistant, that being Jesse, came by and was like, you are, you are not good. At, at doing this you should probably quit the class and I have no idea what it is about me and negative reinforcement But I thrive off of negative reinforcement if somebody tells me I'm bad at something that I'm trying to be good at I'll become massively good at it just to spit on your grave and after that a fire got lit in me I would most likely say that's the hardest thing that's ever happened to me in my art life kind of going into real life but I got a couple stories and to be honest with you I've seen a couple bodies and I don't think you guys are ready for those stories. I've been through some stuff that you simply can't sugarcoat, but the main takeaway that I want you to know from those horrible experiences in my life is that I essentially made them my strength. I got over them and it's not like I don't remember them. I remember them very vividly in my mind, but I turned them into something that I can use to my advantage and that's what I'm most proud of in my life. But if I'm not gonna give you a super deep answer, the thing that I'm most proud of most likely is when I sold a piece called Duality at the KVIE auction. It's a non-for-profit auction and the entire point of this art auction is to get artists to give KVIE art pieces and they use the money that they sell the art pieces off of to fund public programs. KVIE programs, that is. I really just wanted Sesame Street in Sacramento to keep going, so I did that. It even won an award while I was there and sold for 600 and something dollars, I think. So I usually just say 600 because I forgot the real number. 
but it was my very first piece that I was really proud of and that Yoshio looked me dead in the eye and was like, yeah, that's my kid. Sleepless Night Secret says, I've often heard the greatest way to repay your master is to surpass them. There are many great skills Yoshio taught you, but what is a skill slash technique that you've independently developed, if anything? You guys know I take my clay, I center it, I open up, and then I'll usually start to even out my clay with my knuckles, and it makes this kind of beehive form like this. This is evening out my clay to make it much easier for me to pull, but most potters that I see don't even out their clay like this. Most potters that I see just put it kind of in that volcano shape and start pulling, and they have to pull about three to four times to get their maximum height. As for myself, I've already evened out my clay and gotten that little bit of height out of there. So usually I only have to pull two times to reach my medium height and a third time to reach my maximum height. A potter can usually tell, especially a very experienced potter, that you have even or uneven clay on whichever side based on just how your piece feels. All too often do I see people pump out mugs and plates all day long only to realize that their plates and their mugs are like three pounds each. Yeah, a three pound cup is a little bit heavy. But that one simple step in evening out your clay before you even start to pull is massively helpful. It essentially erases one pull. And most potters can tell you, you can mess up a piece in one pull but it makes for a much more even clay product. And that's one thing that I really wanna pass on to the next generation. And that's the one thing that Yoshio passed on to me. He taught me that technique. But as far as my own technique, I don't think I really have one yet. In school, I am massively advanced. If I was brought to a beginning or even an advanced class, they would consider me an advanced person. But in the art world, I am a child. I am still figuring out my way around clay. I do not know the majority of my work. I don't know it like the back of my hand. And that's something that I'm still learning. In the real art world, I'm just a kid. That's why the channel's called Apprentice Potter. I'm technically still an apprentice of Yoshio Taylor, even though I'm not under his direct tutelage each and every day. But that's something that you're gonna have to find out the hard way. When you get out of your classes, even though you might have passed the advanced classes, you are still just a baby to the actual art world. Question from Megan Benke. Oh, hey Megan, I know you. Megan's been following me for quite some time. Do you find that your mood or mental state affects how you are able to create or throw? If it interferes, do you just push through and revisit what you're doing later or when you're in a better state of mind? I am raised off of anime and I'm taught to push through any sort of pain that I might come in contact with. And I'm also taught that each and every time you experience something, there's something to be gained from that. It's like the number one moral trope of anime. Usually I'll sit on the wheel, put on some anime, some cartoons, I'll light some scented candles, because you know your boy loves scented candles. And I'll just sit in my studio all night long and throw. Sometimes I'll even skip a night of sleep just to get some work done. This is the closest thing I have to a church, right? So to sit at that wheel and really give a piece of my soul to create something and see if I can make something more beautiful than the crappy day that I'm having is the closest thing I have to communion with God. But at the same time, if I sit at that wheel and I'm trying to make and I just can't make anything regardless of my mental state, I will walk away and I'll come back to it. Usually not in the same day. Sometimes I don't have enough sleep. Sometimes I forget to eat. Sometimes I'm a little bit stressed. For example, you remember that video that I made just a while back about all the wheels and what somebody should buy for their first wheel? Trying to get that much information in such a short span of time was a little bit stressful. And for some reason, on top of my work, on top of trying to live a healthy lifestyle and going to the gym, making videos, and crafting while still trying to keep a social life was a little bit stressful for me that week. Because of that, for the entire week, I essentially just concentrated on that video. I barely went to the gym actually, which kind of stacks because if you don't take care of yourself physically and mentally, right, you're already stressed and then you're not going to the gym and eating right, it just makes a ball of depression. And it makes, especially if you already have depression, that chance of getting depressed much higher. So to answer your question, honestly, I do usually come back if I can't throw anything. But if I'm having a bad day or I'm in a bad mood, usually I'll go over there anyway. Because sometimes I still have to make things even though I'm having a bad day. And that's the reality of the world. If I'm having a depression day, I still gotta go to work. I still gotta truck through it. I don't get to sit in my bed and have a day off. That's just life. Maribel Aguilar asks, how do you calculate your selling prices and what's the best way to glaze a piece? I've personally always been taught to make sure that you glaze the inside of your foot and also to make sure you trim your foot. That's just my personal opinion. For me, it looks very professional. It looks like you actually took care of the bottom. If you're gonna make cups and just slide them off and not glaze the bottom or you're gonna put them on stilts, it kinda looks like you're a little bit lazy. But as far as my teacher taught me, taking care of the parts that most people don't see really tells you how well they take care of their craft. I'm not gonna say this is the best way to glaze a piece, but whenever I look at a piece and I look at the bottom and I just see straight white and no glaze underneath and nobody trimmed the foot, 
I just think, okay, cool, you made this mug specifically to sell it to me. This mug is probably like one of 200 other mugs you've made this month, and you're just trying to chase after that paper. But when I turn over a mug and I see this, I see that the inside is glazed, the foot ring's been sanded down after the glaze, and somebody actually rounded this off and took care of it and made a pretty good glaze line to where it didn't drip, but it looks like someone just wiped it off. This shows that somebody took care of this piece. Someone gave a damn. Of course, because I'm trained in this way, I like pieces that are made like this. Now, if you're asking what technique to glaze a piece, if I had my choice and I had the equipment and I had the proper ventilation, I would go for spraying. I'm gonna need something that goes up to 200 PSI, but I'm also gonna need a lot of equipment and my own personal storage to do that kind of stuff, and it's just not realistic for most people. So what I usually do is I make five gallon buckets of glaze and then I dip them. I actually do have a sprayer over there, but it doesn't spray a lot and it only goes up to 60 PSI and it's honestly not meant to put glaze through it. As far as how do I sell my pieces, I usually set a base price for my cups and bowls based on how much electricity and time it takes. But I have an amazing support system and I have amazing patrons who support me in this channel. I give them artwork each and every month for my own private stock of stuff that I create every single month. And because of that, I don't really have to worry about my prices. It's not like my mugs go for $50 just because I have 10,000 subscribers and people know me. It's more like I'm able to sell my mugs for a cheaper price because I have so much support. Yeah, my pottery might be in demand. Yeah, you guys might be entering the giveaway for this cup right here. But at the same time, my goal of this channel was not to make money. If you're getting into ceramic artwork simply to make money, You've already lost, man. Alyssa Kennedy asks, on a scale of one to Oscar the Grouch, how dirty of a potter are you? I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm super grouchy. I hate a lot of things for no reason. I'm essentially an old man that likes to lift weights and watch a lot of anime. I guess on a scale of one to Oscar the Grouch, I would have to say Roroni Kenshin's master. Yeah, that guy loved martial arts, kicking booty, and just making pottery. He's probably the only anime character that I can name that does martial arts and makes pottery at the same exact time but also throughout the entire story of Roroni Kenshin, he pretty much just sits in a hut in the mountains and makes pottery. People know about him, but nobody bugs him. He just makes art, and everyone understands that he doesn't like to be bothered. He just wants to make pottery and whoop booty. Sarah Ann asked, how do you know how much to charge for your pots and who's your favorite Avatar The Last Airbender character? And then she notes in little brackets like, my daughter wants to know that one. I need to do a video on this soon. I know that John the Potter already did a video if you want to go check that out. But he's an entrepreneur. He's a businessman. He has to get paid for his time. He makes a mug, he figures out how much time, how much energy, how much materials cost for that mug, and then he charges it up a certain percentage to make profit. That makes sense to me. But I'm a little bit different. I'm more of a private contractor. If you want something from me, you have to personally contact me. I don't have a store or a website. And then I have to like you enough to actually take the commission because I do get to decide what commissions I take. And then I have to charge you a base and figure out how much more I wanna charge you for my time. And if I'm being completely honest with you, usually if I like you a lot, I'll give you a better price than somebody who just contacts me and demands stuff from me. Of course, my patrons on Patreon automatically get a discount. And if I'm being really honest with you, they take the high majority of my pottery. If I do like three kiln loads a month, they get like at least one of those kiln loads. It's in between Uncle Iroh and Zaheer. If I were to give you a real accurate account of my personality, it would be a mixture in between Uncle Iroh from Avatar The Last Airbender and Zaheer from Legend of Korra. One of them is a White Lotus member. He's very kind, he's very understanding. He takes his time with people, he's very giving. He's essentially a good character. And Zaheer is who basically wants to throw the world into chaos as a Red Lotus member. He doesn't believe in deities. He thinks that people should do their own work and that everybody should be equal. He wants to throw the world into chaos so that the world can start over because he thinks that the current system is garbage. And that just, just speaks to me on such a good level. It's one of the same reasons why I kind of like Thanos. Look, I know, I know, every single nihilist or existentialist in the world likes Thanos, but he had some good ideas. This runs from a savage 30 on Instagram. What does candling mean, or are we not there yet? I believe I've already done a video on candling. It was how to run your scut 181. Candling is the process of slowly heating up, especially your bisque ware, in order to get all the water out of it before you turn it on an actual high cone. If you heat up the water inside of your greenware too fast, it usually makes steam. And if you heat up that steam too fast, it usually causes explosions in your pottery. If you don't believe me, go ahead and put wet pottery into a kiln Put it on high, don't wait for it to dry into actual greenware, 
and just wait. This is one of the reasons why I always crack my kiln open whenever I'm candling. Usually I'll load my kiln with greenware, I'll crack that thing open, I'll put it on low for two hours, I'll come back, close a couple holes up, but leave the kiln cracked open, put it on medium for two hours, and then after those four hours are up, I'll put it all the way on high and close the kiln. Opening the top of the kiln allows for moisture to get out because I don't want moisture inside my kiln or my chamber. That's all candling is. It's slowly heating up your pottery to make sure things don't explode. Trish Step... Oh, that's, that's not happening. I'm sorry, Trish. I'm not saying your name. Trish Stefanovich. Yeah, I did it. Look at me, Mom. Trish Stefanovich asks, I'm trying to set up a studio. What are my must-haves in the studio? If you're working in the dark like I am right now, the only reason I'm recording this video in the dark is because I do have work lights. You are definitely going to need a shelf to put your pottery on. If I were to suggest a shelf to you, it would be one with grates on it. This way you can set your pottery on the grates and air can get to the bottom and the top of your pottery as well. If you have something that doesn't allow airflow to the bottom of your pots, airflow is not going to get to the bottom of your pots. And if these are the grates right here and you set your pottery on it, well then air is going to get right here. And that's a good thing, especially when you're drying your pots out. But if you have something flat like this and you put it up here, you're not really going to get a lot of airflow to the bottom of this pot. And if you want flat shelves, you can essentially buy those, go to Home Depot, get some wood cut to fit your shelves, they'll cut them for you, and put them up there, put your pottery on that, and then move the shelves whenever you want. I also suggest a banding wheel. I have one right here from Shimpo. Yes, it's costly, but these things will not break down on you. I also suggest some type of workspace. You don't just need your wheel, you're killing your shelves and a little bit of shimpo down there. You're also gonna need some type of really strong table to take the pressure whenever you're rolling out or working on pottery. Those are the five main things I would say you need to actually get started. And you can find most of those things other than the wheel and the kiln at Home Depot. After that, you're probably gonna start making your own glazes and you're probably gonna need some of these small buckets right here, which again, you can find at Home Depot. But once you find a tried and true glaze that works inside your kiln or your chamber, you're gonna need some bigger buckets like this. These are five gallon buckets, which again, you can find at Home Depot. You know what, in fact, the more stuff you need for your studio, the more you're either gonna go to kitchen stores, Home Depot, and pottery stores. Those are your three main places you're gonna find almost everything. Okay, this one's a really long question, so I'm just gonna shorten it. KT Sandrith asked, what can a new potter do to keep going? Should I sell my stuff? Make art for art's sake, enter contests, give everyone I've ever known a mug, you're most likely in the phase where you're deciding what to do with your artwork. And sooner or later, you're gonna get the bright idea to sell your artwork because you have too much of it. And of course, you have to keep practicing to get better to actually satisfy that thing inside you to make art. When I first started, much like other people's mothers, they just loved their artwork. My mom has the worst artwork inside of her own office that she refuses to give. And I've given her much better stuff, much, much better stuff. I've given her horsehair pieces and she still refuses to get rid of them. Sooner or later, you are gonna have to go to a table. When I went to my first table, I was just trying to get rid of stuff and make enough money to keep going. So I sold everything for $10. Every plate, every cup, every mug, every vase, everything. No matter how heavy or gross or good it was, it was $10. At this point in my life, I'm essentially making stuff for my patrons and you guys for the YouTube channel, and then I'm also making artistic pieces on the side. Stuff like this doesn't come along every single day. I have to try to make stuff that looks like this. But as far as stuff that looks like this, I'm, that's just normal stuff. I can make that anytime I want. But to answer your question, the process that I went through when I was training under Yoshio is that I would make 10 or 20 things. He would come along, he would say which ones he liked the best, he would explain to me why they were the best ones based on how they were formed, how light they were, how even they were, and then I would have to destroy the majority of them, only able to keep about three to five of them. And I'd have to re-wedge the rest of that dirty, nasty clay and make new clay out of it, which taught me a lot of different things about my clay, and then I had to make more. When I finished those three to five mugs, I only got to keep two of them. One I got to keep for myself, and the other one I can either give away or sell. If I were to suggest anything to a beginner, that's what I would do. I would buy a bag of clay, I would make 10 of the same form. I would make 10 bowls, and I would destroy like seven or eight of them. And I would keep the two that I thought were the best. And out of those two, I would trim them, take really good care of them, and then I would pick which one was my favorite based on how I glazed them. I'd write them down in a notebook, and I would start that process all over again until I got really good at bowls. And I wouldn't move on to cups and mugs until I'm satisfied with that step. Das Chasber asked, paint me like one of your French girls. You guys know I don't know how to paint, right? Like, I, I have horrible handwriting. I have horrible spelling, too. The amount of times you guys have corrected me on the Facebook fan page and the Twitter is astronomical. I also have never been with a French girl. Um, so, if I painted you like one of my French girls, it would just be a blank 
page. That's sad. I'm sad now. Oh, let me see your baguette. Ha <laughs> ha. Dwayne Wilde asked, how much pot could a potter pot pot if a potter could pot pot? I live in California, and so I'm probably one of the potters that don't pot pot. But if I were to pot pot, I promise you I could pot more pot than any other potter potted in his entire pottery career. But I also don't have the time to pot pot because, um, because I'm too busy making pot pots. Also, I'm a pudgy potter who doesn't pot pot, but if I did pot pots, I would pot way too much pot and then put Subway into an economic deficit with how much munchies I had. I'm so sorry if I mess up this next name. Charcy Davis asked, how do I get a clean foot ring of glaze? I wax it, but it looks messy. Do you use a special wax, brush, or technique? No, I actually don't use any special wax. That's one of the main reasons I don't use wax resist. Half the time I put wax resist on the bottom of my pots, I glaze my piece, I clean it off a little bit, and then the glaze and the wax mix together to make some kind of wax glaze mesh meld, and I can't seem to get it off, but it does come out in the glaze. Yes, the wax burns off, but that glaze still stays there, so it's not like I can get it off very easily. All I do, and I'm very serious, and no one's gonna believe me when I tell them this, but the only thing I do is that I make sure that I wash my hands, right, because oil will refract glaze. When I touch my bisque, I dip my glaze, I add any little extra thing to it. For example, I put a little bit of brush and silver luster right here on this blue glaze I developed, and after it comes out the dip, there's glaze all on this foot ring right here. I take a sponge, and I just wipe it off like this. And then I make sure that the glaze line is high enough to where it won't drip. After that, I basically take it out of the kiln, I take a piece of sandpaper, and I smooth out my bottoms. That's all I do to all my artwork. Every single piece of my artwork that's not huge or the size of a human being, that's what I do to it. I feel like a lot of people look for all these extra tips and tricks on how to do their stuff, but that's all you need to do. You just need to Occam's razor it down. You just need to do the most simple thing you can do. And I think this is a good technique because this teaches you a couple things. Number one, you learn real quick how runny each and every glaze inside of your collection is. Number two, you learn really quick how to clean off the bottom of your pieces. Okay, we're done. That was a lot of questions. That was a lot of questions. Do you guys want to do some Anon questions on Tumblr? Because they're weird. They're super weird. And let's be honest, if you made it this far, you're probably going to want to watch more weird questions anyway. But I warn you, they're weird, okay? They're weird, some of them are kind of sexual, just letting you know. What's up with your boy Kanye? I don't want to talk about Kanye. I feel like I was in an abusive relationship, you know? I feel like, I feel like I liked Kanye a lot for a very long time, ever since I was like 13, 14 years old. I really repped for him, I was really about it. I even wore the backpack and the polo, and then, like, all of a sudden, he came out of right wing, talking about we should abolish the 13th Amendment. And I don't think he knows if they do, he's like the first one they go after. He's, I don't think he's thinking this all the way through. I feel like an abused spouse. Like, I feel like every time Kanye hit me with some nonsense, I had to defend him to all my friends. Like, no, 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 it's okay, he's really good. You don't see him in private. You don't know the guy that I know. And then he was really good for two months, and then he slapped me back again with some Uncle Tom junk. And then I had to tell all my friends again. No, 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 he's really good. He's, he's actually a cool guy. You don't, you don't know him like I know him. I've been following him for a long time. He's just doing some marketing thing right now. He's not, he's not really like this. But after like the fifth time of him just disappointing me, I decided to leave. I'm not gonna have Stockholm Syndrome, but with music involved. I'm good. I'm, I'm done with Kanye. I, I still like his music to some degree, but all of my respect for him has gone away. And whether it is because of a mental problem or it's because he really thinks that, it doesn't matter to me anymore because he's yo-yoed me so much that I've, I've just decided to leave him. I'm gonna find me a better man. What's your favorite Pokemon? It's Mewtwo. I fell madly in love with Mewtwo for the same reason I fell in love with Thanos. He deeply believed in the first half of the movie that human beings suck, and I massively agree with him. He turned into a soft little Mew at the end of the movie, and I don't agree with it. Who's your favorite YouTuber? You guys are probably expecting something like Tim C or John the Potter or Hishing or Douglas Pottery, uh, but honestly, my favorite YouTubers are not ceramicists. They're usually animators. I like Domix, I like Young Dom the Sauce God. My favorite YouTuber at the moment is Young Dom the Sauce God. I like him for the same reasons that I named earlier in the video. He's self-reflective. He understands what he does wrong, and he thinks about what he does. He looks back on that stuff, and then makes his life better from those experiences. I'm gonna link you guys to one of my favorite videos of him down below in the description, just in case you like him. If you don't like him, whatever, but I like him a lot. I actually made this cup for him, and then he just never replied to his Instagram, so 
is mine now. How big is okay? You don't you don't you don't need to know that. What you gonna do with that information? All right? Cause I know if I tell you, the next question is gonna be like, well, let me see it. And no, get, get go go home. You're drunk. What is your favorite anime movie? It's Digimon. Digimon, the first movie, is by far my favorite actual anime movie. I like Pokemon. I love Pokemon. It's part of my culture. It's part of my being. But to be completely honest with you, Pokemon was a cartoon. Digimon was an anime. And the difference in between the two is that one has emotion. One has stakes. Pokemon was just some kid being sexually frustrated with his not dad problems running around collecting monsters for Michael Vick fights. But Digimon had stakes. The world was at stake throughout the entire arc of all the Digimon series. When Wizardmon died, when your Digimon died, they cried. They had tropes like friendship, love, trust, intelligence. Each and every person had something inside them that they had to find out about themselves. And then after that, they had to go find that throughout a journey. They had to go through some hardship and grow as a human being. Ash has been 13 years old for like 30 years at this point. And that's the difference in between the kind of shows I like. I like stuff with stakes. I need growth. I need a human being to look themselves in the mirror and say, what am I doing wrong? How can I improve? Pokemon had none of that. It taught kids nothing besides like don't abuse animals, I guess. The one lesson I learned from Pokemon really was like in the third or fourth episode with the Sandshrew when he was like, oh, bad Pokemon trainers make bad Pokemon. The Pokemon aren't bad, the trainers are bad and they teach those Pokemon. And it's just like humans in the real world. The animals aren't bad, nothing makes them innately bad. But if the human being trains the dog to be bad, the dog's gonna be bad. You can probably go even deeper and replace the word dog with children at this point to be honest with you. Digimon has like, an actual linear storyline. It wasn't just an episode upon an episode of them following another Pokemon and then some movies. It was an entire journey and that's why I love Digimon the first movie. Okay, this is the last Adon question because not only am I getting tired and I have to go soon, but I'm gonna have to edit all of this because I don't have an editor. I do it all myself. This is gonna be a long video. How old are you? <laughs> It's good, it's good, it's, it's real, it's real good. It's real rich, it's real rich. <laughs> Turn this off now. Hey guys, thank you for coming to the q and I really appreciate it. This is just a little bit of information after the video. Number one, thank you for all the questions. I actually really appreciate them. We got way more questions than I can handle and if I didn't get to your question, I'm really sorry about it. Number two, on December 2nd, I am throwing a party. Yes, I know that's most likely like a week away from when I'm actually gonna give you this video. I'm gonna edit it as fast as I can because today is the day after Thanksgiving. So on December 2nd in Sacramento, California, at 6 p.m. at Sensi or Ceramics, you can look up the address, or I'm just gonna put it here on the screen so you can just not look it up, I can just give it to you. Anyone is welcome, I catered a bunch of food, we have a bunch of coffee, hot chocolate, tea, I've already supplied all the clay for you guys, it's gonna be a good time. I really just wanna do kind of a meet and greet with you guys, but I don't wanna go anywhere. So I kinda just wanna have it in Sacramento, California, so that way anyone who can get to me, just gets to me. A couple of you guys have been asking to meet me and I don't think I'm that cool. I knew sooner or later I would have to fly out somewhere and do a meet and greet, so I think this is kind of just the tester version of that. I don't think I have nearly enough subscribers to actually have a real meet and greet. So think of this as kind of just me wanting to hang out with you. And don't forget if you do actually want to win this mug, all you got to do is like, comment, already have been subscribed, and make sure you check your messages because if you do win and I send you a message saying you won and you don't give me your address to send this to you, then like why'd you, like I don't, I, who's the go-to at that point? If you don't answer your DMs, whether it be on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, I, I will, I will give this to one of my patrons. They will be happy to take it. They support this channel. They deserve this. But thank you, Dirty Potters, for joining me today. If you want to see any of my actual artwork, the links are down below. Don't forget to enter in for that cup if you really want that cup. I don't do giveaways very often, and I absolutely have no problem giving it to my patrons or just destroying it, to be honest with you. I have no problem destroying that thing. But thank you guys for coming, and I will see you, Dirty Potters, next week. Oh yeah, no, I agree. It was a little bit dramatic. Was it a power move? Yes. Did I mean it? Yes. Do I find value in every single piece of artwork that I make? No. But do I regret doing it? No. <laughs>